Hello and welcome back to another historical video of Forgotten Orb 2 and this time I'm going to tell you something about the historical background of the map Silo Heights and um, the battle it was based on. Um, and I will also talk a bit about uh, Russian and German late war equipment. So first of all um, this map is based or it's a remake of an FH1 map and I wasn't involved in that one, so I don't know how much uh, or how exactly it is scaled and how close it is to real life um, in the nitty gritty details. That being said, um, I think it captures the uh, essence of that engagement very well. Now, uh, first of all, uh, just to locate this battle in, in history, it was uh, started on April 16th, 1945, and in many ways it was one of the last um, engagements uh, in the European theater of World War II. By this time the Western Front um, had pretty much collapsed. There were small battles here and there, but mostly Germans there were surrendering. However, in the East, uh, the fighting raged on. Um, and of course in the Pacific, but okay. Now, the, this was part of the Battle of Berlin. Uh, the Silo Heights were the last defensive obstacle in front of Berlin. That being said, uh, contrary to popular opinion, uh, Berlin was actually the last battle on the European continent. For one thing, I think the last really big battle that was started was the Prague Offensive, which um, the fighting of that actually raged on um, till after the, the signing of the surrender. So there's that. And also after after the surrender there were still sometimes battles. For example, one of the last ones was in the Netherlands, where the Germans fought against uh, auxiliaries from Georgia that rebelled against them. And that was only stopped by the British army arriving. So yeah. Anyway, but back to this. It was April the 16th and um, the Soviets wanted to reach Berlin. And in order to do that, they had to get past the German defensive line on the Silo Heights. Now, um, this proved to be pretty hard, and the Soviets actually did lose quite a few men in this battle, and quite a, quite a bit of equipment, and in order to explain this, let's look at the uh, overall battlefield. Now, the battlefield is basically um, bisected uh, to areas. The first one is where, where I am right now is the so-called Oderbruch or Oder River Valley. And then over here in the west you have the Silo Heights themselves. But first the Oder River Valley. Now the Oder River Valley is very uh, flat and it is very very wet. Uh, in fact um, Berlin is below sea level and if you are ever in Berlin you might notice that there are like um, pipes and pumps. Some of them look like um, like modern art projects, but they are really there to um, to uh, keep it from flooding, because Berlin was basically built in a swamp. And the Oder River Valley, uh, especially um, in April 1945 in the spring, was very um, wet, very damp. It had rained quite a bit. There was lots of mud, and there were lots of slightly flooded fields. Um, generally speaking, the uh, terrain there is um, there's not a lot of cover because most of it are fields. Uh, like if you look on the main ma uh, on the mini map, you can see a field to our south. Uh, and especially in the um, in the spring, there aren't a lot of crops on those fields, so there's not a lot of cover. Uh, making matters worse for the attacking Soviets was that the um, that the fields themselves are bordered by canals, um, like this, little ditches that were muddy and filled with water, which basically made them natural anti-tank obstacles. This became uh, especially important later. Now, um, basically there were um, there was one outpost line the Germans had that was relatively lightly held that was in the Oder River Valley, usually formed around little hamlets or villages in that area. Um, due to the ditches and the mud, Soviet tanks were canalized uh, because they had to stick to the roads, which of course led through the villages. And so these were made into strong points where Germans uh, waited in ambush with um, Panzerfaust, for example. Um, 
Now the main line of resistance or in German Hauptkampflinie was all along the bluffs of um, of the uh, actual heights uh, and it was called the uh, Steinstellung or stone position and uh, this is uh, where the main fighting happened from. Now the Soviets launched a huge artillery barrage um, of all calibers, I think up to 200, 203 millimeter. Um, that being said, the Germans had pulled back most of the first line in the Oderbruch, so much of that um, barrage landed um, nowhere useful. Although, of course, uh, the Silo Heights themselves were also bombarded. Um, additionally, um, the Soviets attacked uh, in the very early morning when it was still dark out and um, what they tried to do was create artificial moonlight using big searchlights. This is something that had been done um, for example in Normandy as well during Operation Total Life where searchlights had been um, used to bounce light off the um, cloud cover in order to illuminate the battlefield. Now the Soviets tried this as well but it mostly failed. And for one thing as you can imagine it um, illuminated the attacking troops as well which made it easier to shoot at them from up the height. Um, but in addition to that, the opening barrage, heavy as it was, um, had kicked up a lot of dirt and dust and uh, clouds of smoke, which reflected back the, um, the light and actually blinded Soviet troops and made it harder to see. Now, um, let's look at some of the details down here. So the first flag we have is the Manor flag which uh, to me basically represents um, many of these small villages down in the Oderbruch where the Soviets had to uh, fight through because they have to use or had to use the roads. And this is true in here as well because if you look at the minimap there's a fairly harsh, uh, harsh um, bottleneck right here because you have this canal and this canal so you have to go either through this or up here, the smaller one. So you're really canalized here. And this is what happened to the Soviets as well in real life. And of course at this point um, German infantry was very well equipped with infantry anti-tank weapons, uh, especially the Panzerfaust disposable rocket launcher. Well, technically it's not a rocket launcher, it's a recoilless gun. Now one detail we um, have on this map are these slogans. Now many people ask uh, what these mean, I can actually translate them while I'm here. So this means um, Berlin remains German. Most of these, I think actually all of these slogans um, are based on real life photographs. So let's see. Now this train station is there in real life as well at the foot of the uh, heights, as is um, the bridge here, although it looks a bit different. This is actually a main road in this area, Bundesstraße. Now, um, the train station is not a complete copy of the of the real one. We we wanted to do that at first, but um, we didn't have the time. So instead, this is a reskinned version of the uh, of the normal train station that we have that you also can see in, on Battle of the Bulge maps. Uh, this slogan, by the way, Sieg oder Siberien, means uh, victory or Siberia. So, yeah. Anyway, this train station, as I said here in real life as well, although I think these um, train sheds behind there are mostly fictional, uh, in the original FH1 version, um, this whole area had like a mine in it, which really isn't there in real life. Uh, I think the solution is a bit more realistic by having these uh, train service buildings and sheds. Um, and it also serves as a nice spawning area. This year, jetzt geht's ums Ganze. Wir schaffen es doch, means um, basically how to best translate it. Um, uh, now it's getting serious, we will make it anyway. So yeah, now that concludes the Oderbruch. Now, the actual Seeloa Höhen or Silo Heights, uh, you can see up here. These aren't really all that high. They're not like um, like Alps or anything. Um, but due to the really flat and open terrain, they are commanding. And um, that's why the main line of, of resistance was up there. Now, 
After the Russians failed to breach the defenses on the first day, um, the commanding officer, uh, Zhukov, actually kind of lost his cool or got impatient and he committed his tank reverse, which really by Soviet doctrine you're not supposed to do that. Basically, what you're supposed to do is you um, break through with your infantry and once you've broken through you uh, commit the tank force for exploitation, right? Um, so he c threw the tanks in to, to add more weight to the actual assault and to, to the terrain here down here, which I already explained. They got bunched up and were easy pickings for anti-tank guns and artillery and placed up on the heights. Um, on top of that, the Germans had registered the fields down here for artillery and especially Nebelwerfers were very effective at keeping uh, Soviet infantry at bay. Now in gameplay terms, I do like this area because again you have these bottlenecks. They are a bit less harsh than in the original um, FH1 version, because I think this one wasn't here for one thing. But basically you have this uh, center part here, where you can go up with tanks, you can go up here, the north, uh, and here, and then there are some areas where infantry can get up, and I think tanks can uh, get up as well. For example, I remember when I worked on this, oops, what I did is I made this area, in here where the crash train is, so that infantry can climb up here. But I think I've seen tanks drive up there as well. It's probably hard, but you can do it. It's a bit risky, of course. But yeah. And so I think in that regard, um, the map replicates the problems that the Soviets faced in assaulting this position quite well. So um, these bunkers, by the way, I don't know if they were there. I know that the uh, Germans had fortified the hills, including concrete pillboxes. I don't know if they looked exactly like this. Uh, these are Westwall wall bunkers, Westwall bunkers, that were made for Hurtgen Forest especially. So they might be slightly out of place, but they certainly had concrete pillboxes up here, there. Anyway, um, now let's switch over to the German side. Okay, spawned in. So, yeah, this by the way is what uh, German road signs look like. And we have more slogans here, Berlin bleibt Deutsch, Berlin remains German. And over here, also a nice one, Die Wende kommt durchhalten, um, which basically means the uh, turnaround will come, um, uh, keep going. So, okay. Now from this, from these hills, or from this, um, from these heights, you really had a commanding view of the countryside, which I think you can see very well here. And I think this is part of why the uh, Russians often have trouble in the first sector, even though they have these overwhelming numbers of tanks and so on, because in addition to fighting the Germans that are actually holding the Oderbruch down here, they also um, they also are under attack from the hills. Which is, again, historically accurate. So, the city of Silo itself is directly behind here. Now, let's talk a bit about the German forces. Now, the, well, first of all, the Russian forces that attacked were basically guards, infantry, um, supported by tanks. Um, and they had a lot of tank support, especially after the tank armies got committed. And uh, so there were lots of T-34s, of course, but also IS-2s and ISU-152s which sadly we don't have, so we substitute the older model, the SU-152. But they also had, of course, SU-76s, which are one of the most common Soviet tank, or assault gun, rather. Now, the Germans holding this sector um, were, for one thing, um, the, uh, actually a Fallschirmjäger division, and for a while I thought maybe put a Fallschirmjäger loadout on here with FG-42s and so on, but then I decided against that because this map already has lots of obscure or late wars weapons, so I uh, didn't want to overdo it. You can't put everything cool on the same map. Uh, and in support was the Müncheberg Panzer Division, which was one of the last German tank divisions that was created. And um, they had uh, lots of different uh, tanks, really a crap bag, mostly Panthers, but there were also, I think there was also um, King Tigers and Tiger Ones in there, Yak Panthers, or I think one of them, um, as well as they had one unit of infrared equipped 
panzers as well, including infrared equipped infantry. So yeah, but generally speaking, not not the highest quality panzer division ever because it was so late, and training of course had become an issue. Um, anyway, let's look at uh, some of the late war equipment that we have on here for Germany, especially uh, our Volkssturm weapons. Now this map is the only one where you can use the new Volkssturm guns that we introduced in um, 2.5. First example is this one, you have to pick them up from the map and then you get an anti-tank kit you know, with a Panzerfaust, uh, 60 meter or 100 meter, and um, then a Volkssturm weapon. And this is the, uh, in game it's called the, one second, the Volkssturm Gewehr 45. I think it was mostly called the Volkssturm Gewehr Gustloff. And uh, now first of all the Volkssturm was a mad project by the Nazi party to create a people's militia to defend uh, the Reich. Um, these were often not very well equipped. Often uh, they didn't have enough rifles for everybody or they used captured ones like Italian ones or Yugoslavian ones or whatever. Um, and of course the personnel were, were those who were unfit for actual military service, so either too young or too old. My um, <coughs> sorry, my great grandfather was actually in the Volkssturm. Believe it or not, um, he had already fought in World War One. So when he got called up again, he was like, "Yeah, no, I'm not doing this again." And he went there. He got issued a K98K, and then he just went home and stole the rifle and thought, "Hey, well, at least I got a free rifle out of this." And the war is over soon anyway, so he got away. But okay, anyway, back to the actual topic. Um, Sometimes um, weapons were actually produced exclusively for the Volkssturm, which were not part of the normal um, Wehrmacht um, or Waffen as uh, logistical organization because they were uh, under the Nazi party. Which is, of course, again, one of those things where you think, well, this is stupid to have this kind of logistical um, chaos. But they did it, and uh, this is one of the products of this, uh, the Volkssturmgewehr Gustav, which was a semi-automatic gun firing the same um, ammo as the SDG-44 assault rifle, just, you know, only in semi-automatic, but it did use the same 30-round magazine. In-game, it, it kind of plays like the M1 carbine, maybe a bit heavier. The model, as almost all of our weapons was made by Seth a Soldier, and the animations I think by um, Too Cool to Fool, maybe? I hope I'm not saying anything wrong. Yeah, I don't think I actually used this on a recording, maybe I should try to. Generally speaking, of course, an SDG-44 is just better, but it, uh, it's decent, I think. That's reloaded. Uh, the whole thing, it kind of functions like a pistol, that the whole um, you know slide in front has to be pulled back. So that's one of our secret weapons here. Let's look at the other. So here we have the uh, second Volkssturm we weapon, the Volksgewehr K98, which is basically just a cheap version of the K98K uh, bolt-action rifle. Now, it does work a bit different in-game, because it's actually a single-shot weapon in-game. Now, the thing is that these certainly were also produced with magazines, five-shot magazines, at least um, the Forgotten Weapons guy on his YouTube channel had a video where he, where he showed one that had a magazine. That being said, apparently some were also produced with without a magazine where you really had only one shot. Uh, so we decided to go with that uh, simply because it offered some gameplay variety, because I don't think we have a proper single-shot rifle in the mod so far, unless you count uh, an anti-tank rifle, for example. So that made it a bit more unique. Generally speaking, um, I think the, the first weapon, the Volkssturmgewehr Gustloff, was actually used in uh, Thuringia, not in the Berlin area, although Thuringia is in eastern Germany and uh, there are pictures of them in use on the Oder River and you know this is at the Oder River so it's not wrong about these I don't know where they were used generally speaking because they were produced locally they were also used locally uh, I know for example there's a whole series of uh, Volkssturm rifles that we don't have in game from the state I live in in uh, Hess so anyway 
that uh, concludes our look at the German weapons. Let's go back to the Soviet side for a bit and uh, then we will call it a day. So, um, the Soviet weapons uh, didn't actually change all that much uh, toward the end of the war. In the beginning of the war, they were a lot, uh, they were different a lot, but in um, 1945 um, they basically were, basically were fine, you know, with their infantry weapons um, and also to a degree with their tanks. That being said, there was some new stuff introduced and one of them I'm using is the CM44 carbine, which is only available on this map, which has the integral um, bayonet and this was supposed to be the replacement for all bolt action rifles the Soviets had. They didn't want to have the long models anymore except maybe for sniping. Uh, that being said, this went right out of the window when they um, went for the intermediate cartridge. Where so basically what they did want to do then was replace the PPSH-41 with the AK-47 and the bolt action rifles with the SKS carbine. And in the end they just went with the AK of course. Um, now the other detail I want to mention is uh, that the tank hunter kit actually uses a German weapon, a Panzerfaust, and this is not uh, historically inaccurate. They captured this many of them that they actually printed their own uh, manuals for them and um, they did actually uh, issue them quite a bit. That being said, they were mostly used not like in-game to hunt tanks, but mostly as a kind of engineering equipment to blow up uh, barriers or houses from afar. Um, that was not because they didn't work for anti-tank purposes, but just that there weren't that many German tanks at this point in the war. And um, the Russians, if they encountered German tanks, could easily counter them with their own either artillery or tanks or uh, anti-tank guns. And they didn't feel the need to uh, invest much in infantry anti-tank. Now after the war, of course, they um, produced their own Panzerfaust-like weapon, the RPG-1. Now, interestingly, uh, the same was true for the landed lease bazookas that they got. Now, this is actually an interesting story because I did look into this. Back in FH1, the Soviets had the bazooka as their main um, anti-tank weapon. Now, apparently they did get bazookas in 1942, so, so this would have been the early version of the bazooka, uh, the one that you maybe know from Zidi Now, um, there are there's some talk that, um, because the Germans did actually reverse engineer the bazooka and uh, built the Panzerschreck out of it, uh, scaled it up. Now, um, some claim that the bazooka that the, this was based on were captured in North Africa from the Americans, but uh, there's some debate or over whether they might have gotten them from Russia in 1942. So they were possibly used on the front line there. That being said, the only picture I know of a Russian using a bazooka on the front line is an engineer in 1944, and it's the old version of a bazooka by the way, uh, during the crossing of the river Vistula. He is jumping out of a boat and has one on his shoulder. So I'm guessing that these were again not really used to hunt tanks but to um, blow up stuff from afar. And I mean especially those early bazookas weren't that great against uh, heavier German tanks anyway. So yeah, that concludes our look at um, late war weapons as well as, of course, silo heights. Um, I, I really hope you enjoyed it and thought it was interesting. And uh, as always, thanks for watching and have a nice day.